On this episode of Real Christianity, does God care about what we wear to church? Important conversation coming up right now. Welcome to Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge. Today, we're going to have a great conversation about dress at church. But first, if you have not checked out the pre-order for my newest children's book, Simple Theology, which is a gospel catechism for kids, it's a hundred questions. It's a Q&A style catechism, hundred questions on teaching your kids the gospel, basic theology. And it's what's unique about this particular catechism, because there's great catechisms that are already out there. There's the Westminster Shorter Catechism. There's the Heidelberg Catechism. There's the Baptist Catechism. I've taken a lot of the beautiful parts of those catechisms and ad adapted and modernized and edited and put it into one catechism with a hundred questions. The thing that I like about it most is that we created three categories. I have four kids. And when I was doing catechism time with our kids, my older daughter would have the ability to answer more difficult questions and have more robust answers while my younger kids were not. And so I, it was frustrating for me to have to create multiple different answers for different age groups when I'm catechizing the whole family. And so in this catechism, we created uh, three categories where we have uh, you know, these seedlings, um, sprouts and vines is what we call them. And so the seedlings are for like little kids, maybe three to seven, three to five, and then sprouts are maybe, you know, six to eight or zone. And then um, vines are a little bit, you know, maybe 10 and up or something around that zone. And honestly, they would be even fine for adults. And so you can actually ask one question and have three different answers that are essentially the same answer in a shortened version and have your children participate at different degrees. And so uh, it's, a, I think it's a really great resource. I, I worked on it for over a year and it's got great custom illustrations. It's a beautiful book. It's a, a gift book in the sense that it's gold foil cover, hardback, uh, you know, satin ribbon marker, you know, antique cream pages. Uh, you know, it's just a really well done book. And so if you want to get a copy, we're selling them that they'll be ready to deliver before Christmas. Uh, of 2023 uh, here. And you can pick up a copy at relearn.org forward slash simple. Again, that's relearn.org forward slash simple. Okay, we're going to talk about, does God care about how we dress at church? Now, this is based off of an article that I wrote that's available to read at relearn.org. So if you wanted to read that or share that, you can always check that out. And I'm going to be referencing that quite a bit here uh, and kind of reading a little bit and then coming back and having some conversation about what I'm saying. So today's Christians think that intimacy requires casualness. I want you to think about that statement for a second. Today's Christians think that intimacy demands casualness, that essentially we believe that intimacy with God can only be attained if you can you know, approach God the way that you are right? That's kind of this generation's, you know, MO is that I want to, I want to come, come as you are, you know, come as you are. Um, and I, I think that that belief really does manifest the way that we worship, the way that we show up for worship. And I think there's some truth to that, come as you are. Um, and I think that's at the truth level, it's, it's pertaining to come at the state of your soul, <laughs> um, wherever you're at, if you're a drug addict or if you're, uh, you know, think that everything's good in your life, you think that everything's, you're, you just got divorced, you whatever it is, come as you are. I, I think that is a very faithful way to interpret that phrase. Now, come as you are in your pajamas, I think is not a faithful way to interpret that reality. And I think our casual culture has certainly uh, contributed to a misunderstanding of that particular phrase and idea. And so a Sunday gathering to millennials or Gen Z 
uh, you know, that is formal, liturgical, um, spiritually reverent. These can sometimes feel distant or impersonal or, or lifeless even uh, for that generation because we prefer this, again, this organic, relaxed, unstructured, uh, spiritual experience that prioritizes, you know, emotions and warmth over solemnity and reverence. And so that's very common in our generation. But I- I'm I'm just going to say this cavalier approach that we have to worship to Sunday, uh, it should concern us for a couple of reasons. Number one, it doesn't match the example of the Old Testament. Now I understand you know, biblical theology and that the Old Testament is essentially the way that they dressed as a high priest to worship is pointing to Christ and preparing us for Christ and who is our ultimate high priest. But I I just want to read you something from Leviticus about how you would approach God in the temple, right? And just, this is just one of many verses, but it's Leviticus chapter 16, verse four. He says, he shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. He shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. He shall take them from the congregation, or he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel, two male goats for a sin offering, one for a ram, a burnt offering. There's just a formality. And I think the principle of formality, not the theological meaning behind this particular text, but the principle of formality, I think is seen throughout the Old Testament uh, regarding worship. Now, you can create lifeless worship real quick, which is what Jesus came to fix, right? He came to fix this idea that you're worshiping with all the outside and not the inside. Now, I think that this generation has possibly made an overextension of that idea where we worship with all the inside and have no care about the outside. And we, we, when you think about even our buildings, like go look at the description and instruction for like the tabernacle or the temple. One is that God requires beautiful architecture and beautiful artist artisan work and quality development in every possible category. And we're in this generation that it's like, hey, you know what? I know it's an old Domino's pizza building, but let's turn it into a church, you know? And we have no desire to actually create, say, architecture that accurately reflects the goodness of the salvation that we have in Christ. I mean, literally, it's like, come to this terribly ugly building where we can tell you the best news ever. Like, it's inconsistent, right? There's a, there's, there's a, you know, it's like serving this beautiful filet mignon on paper plates, right? It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Now, I'm not saying that if you worship under a tree because the tree is all you have in Ghana, that you're doing anything wrong. I'm just saying is that the heart posture should be that it's not just about the inside. It's also about the outside. It's about both. Um, Because essentially, which I'm going to say in a minute, because I'm getting ahead of myself, God doesn't just care about your inside soul. He also cares about your body and your life and your work and what you do and do everything unto the Lord. And so does your church building glorify God? Does it actually, people look at it and go, man, those people are incredible artisans. That reflects the goodness of God that they preach in Jesus Christ. So again, just a question for you to consider here. A couple of the scriptures, right? So we know um, Hebrews, right? It says chapter 12, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Now, again, you're, if you're from this generation, you're just going, oh, well, that's an internal thing. Reverence and awe, that's an internal thing. God doesn't care about what I wear. I would just argue against that. I think that God does care. He, I think that the internal should match the external and the external should match the internal. Um, and I think that we know this to be true in several other circumstances. Um, so before I get ahead of myself, second point is that, you know, the irreverent atmosphere can, in our churches today of, you know, mega church mania and all this stuff can sometimes stumble the truly brokenhearted. 
and the truly hurting in our congregations who are actually looking for some form of stability, you know, theological footing, and not just like an exaggerated experience or some sort of pageantry. And so there's, there is like a group of people that come in broken. And we think that just let's be happy clappy is going to make it all better. When sometimes people actually are encouraged by solemnity or reverence or seriousness in some degree. And so how have we arrived here? Um, I just can't think that this is kind of a byproduct of our casual culture that we have today uh, where everybody wears yoga pants to work, you know, and um, we have this obsession with equality and egalitarianism. And, uh, you know, let me tell you, like the cry of our culture is everyone is the same. Okay. That's basically a banner over the millennial Gen Z. We're all the same. We're all the same in the sense of, you know, distinctions, whether by station, rank, gender, sex, race, they're offensive to our society's social craze for symmetry. We want this idea that we're all kind of, you're not better than me. I'm not better than you. Um, I could do anything you can do better. You know, that whole kind of concept, uh, you know, oh, you're a guy and you're a police officer. I'm a woman and I can do exactly what you do. Just as the same. And you know, you're you're a mother, I'm a chest feeder. I can do the same thing too, I, whatever, right? It's dumb. It's just a dumb thing that we are dealing with in our generation. Think about this. I was thinking about this a couple of days ago. Like when in history have you had to, like I, all the theologians of past, like some are fighting for like definitions of the Trinity, some are fighting for like definitions of church government or soteriology, like MacArthur and Sproul fought against like the prosperity gospel. And like, we're over here as pastors fighting against like the delusion of there's more genders than male and female. Like what time in history could humanity not answer the question, what is a woman or what is a man or what is a baby or whatever? And so this is a, a fascinating time, but that's how totally like lost we are as a culture in the sense that we're so confused. A lot of my time, if you guys follow me on social media and other pl uh, platforms, is that I'm speaking about gender, masculinity, femininity, reminding us of the basics. Honestly, I would love to be talking more about deep theology, but like we need to get back to the basics of Genesis 1. And so, or not just Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And so, um, I, I think that we have this kind of extended our classlessness uh, to our worship, whereby we approach God in a sense as if he's kind of like one of us, you know, um, you know, he's, Jesus is my friend, you know, he's, he's a, he's a friend of mine, you know, and, and that kind of culture and the historical traits of honor and respect and awe and reverence, like they've just been lost in our pursuit of sameness and informality. And so we often display more reverence and awe at, especially with our dress uh, and like decorum and like business dinners and weddings than we do at the worship of Yahweh. And so it's just, it doesn't make sense to me. And I, Dr. Steve Lawson, who was my preaching professor, he does a really great video. I, I just recently saw him being interviewed, maybe on Ligonier about this, about why it's important to, to dress in a way that reflects what you're doing. Um, police officers do it. Um, doctors do it. Um, like the idea that dress communicates something is really important. Um, and you know that, right? Because, you know, the blue haired chick that's got her, you know, face all pierced up and, you know, a shirt that says whatever, like that's communicating something too. And so dress does communicate something. It's not worthless and outside of God's care. Uh, he cares about modesty. He cares about uh, how we communicate this concept of reverence and awe and worship through the way that we dress. And so, um, I, yeah, I have another note here is that you know, while, while we would never consider wearing casual attire to dine with the King of England, we readily do so when worshiping the King of Kings. And so I, I believe, again, we've over-spiritualized religion 
Um, and I, I don't, you know, like, how can you do that, Dale? How can you over-spiritualize? Well, I think believing that God is solely concerned with the internal condition of the heart and disregards external factors of our bodies. Um, I just saw some lady that was talking about like, you know, God doesn't care about what we do with our bodies. I'm a bisexual Christian. Like my heart's right. And, you know, it's like, no, that, that, that is not, Jesus did not just purchase your soul. He purchased your body. First Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Okay, uh, let's just take that at face value. You know, what we do with our bodies and dress, physical posture even, like what we do, which is why I'm kind of not an advocate of the yoga world, holy yoga or whatever. Um, what we do with our body matters. And if we're, you know, putting our body through whatever particular movements, um, if we're sexualizing our body or putting our bodies in ways that are sens- creating in- increasing sensuality in the wrong places, um, you know, what we do in our bodies and what we wear on our bodies is also important to God. Again, if you don't have the funds to buy these great clothes, God's looking at the heart. He understands the heart, but I'm just saying is that don't just throw the body and the external out. Now, uh, I'm not calling for some like deadpan, you know, custom of like Romish religious costumes. That's not my call here. I'm not even demanding that you men need to wear a suit or tie on Sunday. Uh, I'm simply pointing out that you can have reverent worship and orderly worship that's really displayed with beautiful dress and, and, and honorable attire. You can have that and have a vibrant internal spiritual life too. You can, you can have both. Uh, you can wear suits, you can wear beautiful dresses and cover your head. As you guys know that, a little plug for my book, Cover for Glory, right? Um, and you can still have emotion and passion for Christ. It doesn't have to be like all casual or all buttoned up in deadpan, like lifeless religion. It, like you can do both. You can have an incredible spiritual, emotional relationship with Christ in reverence and awe while dressed in an appropriate way that reflects the internal reality of what's going on. Uh, you don't have to have one or the other. And so ultimately, again, our, our decorum should be in step with who we are engaging with. And we know this in every other area of our life. Like you're not going to show up to a job interview dressed in casual wear, but people show up to church that way. Um, it's very strange. And so when it comes to God, God is holy. He is completely other than us or separate from us. He's not like us. Therefore, the external aspects of our worship should not only or should not only match the character of who we're meeting with, which is God, to go worship God, but also the internal disp- disposition of our souls toward him. Um, so yes, Christ is our friend, Right. There is an element of that as a dimension of our relationship where Christ is a friend. Uh, there's a dimension of our, our relationship where Christ is a brother. He is also king. He is also Lord. He is also uh, maker in the sense that God is our maker. Uh, he is our provider. And, uh, and so what we do in body and spirit both matter. Now, I'm going to bring up a, a point that I just actually saw. It was Piper. Um, John Piper recently tweeted out, he says, this is on September 30th. So 2.7 million uh, impressions on this on X, which is formerly Twitter. Uh, He says, can we reassess whether Sunday coffee sipping in the sanctuary fits? And he cited Hebrews 12, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And I remember seeing that going, okay, like, let me think about this for a second. Piper's asking for the removal or not asking, he's asking the question, should we be just like casually sipping coffee in the front row? And like, would you do that at a wedding for like a formal wedding in a nice church while people are giving their vows? Like, would you be just like sipping your Starbucks there? So that is an interesting comment. 
the, the most interesting comment I saw is from a pastor who said, I once had a family roll up to church and in the front row ate a full blown Burger King meal just sitting right there in the front row during church. And I, again, we, I think it's easier for us to go, oh yeah, like I would never do that. I would never just straight like open up my dipping sauces and like set my drink on the floor and like start dipping fries and like throwing down a burger in the front row on Sunday morning. But what Piper's getting at is, uh, should we should we be kind of casualizing this? Are we coming with reverence and awe because the external reality of sipping coffee doesn't seem real reverent? It seems actually very casual, very com. You know, like the the priority is comfort, not worship. And I, I was looking at comments, and people are like, in the cat, people from from the Catholic Church were like, no way this would ever happen here, or the Eastern. Orthodox church, like no way this is going to happen here. Or the Lutheran church, people are like, no way this is going to happen here. And so I, I've honestly seen a lot of people, men and women, unfortunately, leave the Protestant church for those other, and I'd say the Lutherans and Anglicans and all those guys are in, but in Eastern Orthodoxy is playing footsie with Rome. But, uh, but uh, people are moving to the tr- traditional historic Roman Catholic world because they're looking for something serious. They look at our pageantry and casualism of today and they're like, this ain't it. This ain't it. And and so again, I'm just calling for an examination of can you do both? Can you come dressed in a way that if you were literally meeting Christ, what would you wear? Um, and can you still do that without feeling like you're you're like losing the come as you are element of Christ loves me how I am? Like, yeah, he does. Um, but there's still an element of of body and internal that we get to wrestle with. And yeah, what are you going to do at sanctuary at the sanctuary? And what are you going to do at church? Like, how can we essentially elevate the reverence and the awe of worship? And I think Hebrews supports that. I think that should be a priority for us as churches. Um, how can we do that in our churches to elevate reverence and awe? And sometimes it requires formality, which our generation hates. And so good questions to ask, um, good topic to think about. If this episode was helpful for you, would you guys be willing to leave a review? You don't have to even write anything. You could just tap the stars in your podcast app. However, if you do write something, I will read it. And I think we're going on 7,000 uh, reviews strong here at Real Christianity. And those reviews really do help the exposure to our show. And so it's a great way to get other people to listen to what we're doing over here. Um, on that note, thank you guys for listening to this episode of Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge, and I'll see you guys next time. 